Right, okay, good. So, good afternoon, welcome along. Um, my guest today is Stuart Winter. Um, some of you may not necessarily know him straight away, but he is, was, is a successful journalist, um, latterly working for the, uh, the, the Express in UK, um, writing about a lot of conservation issues, but in the style of that newspaper, of course. But first and foremost, he is a birder and a conservationist. And I think, to be honest with you, uh, Stuart, I think maybe you should uh, give us a little intro on yourself because you, I've, I've known you now for, God, I don't know how many years now, a few years, and we have spent some time together, which I'm sure you're gonna be talking about later, uh, when we were both incarcerated. <laughs> that word. But Stuart, welcome along. Please tell us about yourself quickly. Well, yeah, we'll go into our original lockdown a little later. But um, I mean, I've been a journalist. I recently retired from Fleet Street, although I still got a weekly column in the Sunday Express on birds and birding. Um, I was a crime reporter. I was a news editor. But long before that, I was a birder. So I can literally say that I was birding from the pram. I remember, I, like you, David, I come from London. I was brought up in the East End of London. And I remember my mum taking me over a bomb site or the periphery of a bomb site back in the late 50s and um, there was a kestrel hovering up in the sky and she didn't know what the bird was but she just told me that it was um, a poor bird had been stuck in the wind and that was my sort of like seminal moment for, for um, bird, bird watching because so I was just so sympathetic towards this poor bird thinking it was stuck forever in the wind and um, I got my first observer book of birds at the age of five and then it's been sort of Daniel or Huffield all the way after that. So when you saw your first Kestrel, how old were you? About four or five? I, think I was definitely in the pram. I can remember being in the pram. It was a place called Haggerston Park, which is sort of right in the East End, yeah. um, just up from sort of Old Street and those sorts of areas. And um, after that, we moved up into the countryside. Um, my mum and dad moved up to one of these um, London new towns and saw greenness for the first time. We had fields surrounding our council estate. And um, with a group of friends, we used to go off exploring. And one of those guys, um, you asked about what I mean, where I would have been, or where I would like to have been today. One of those guys, sort of 50 odd years, or well, nearly 60 years later. Um, we were supposed to be in Hungary today. We planned to um, go to the Hort of Bajny and um, go looking for woodpeckers and what have you. And, you know, 60 year friendship and we've been bird watching most of those years and um, next week it would have been the 50th and or is the 50th anniversary of our very first trip together to Minsmere and uh, I'm sort of working with the RSPB at the moment to see if I can get a special permission to go onto the reserve May the 17th to actually reprise our trip and I mean what was great about that was um, Bert Axel I don't know if your listeners know of him but he was like Mr Minsmere created perhaps England's most famous nature reserve. Um, we went there on a, it wasn't a school trip, it was with a local natural history society. Um, we went there and by car. And um, lo and behold, I mean, one of the birds we saw that day flying under the sort of tower, under the shadow of um, Sizeville Tower Station was um, a little egret. And it was a rare bird in those days. It was literally an officially an, um, a British Birds um, Rarities Committee rare bird. And um, I'm just got a little visitor here. I'm just going to come. <laughs> the dog's just come in. <laughs> but um, we saw we saw a little egret, and that was a sort of precursor to this mass invasion, which sort of effectively my, my first um, lesson in climate change. But at the other end, the very last bird we saw that day was a, a red-backed shrike. And I don't know, again, if the people realise that the red-backed shrikes that were nesting in England. Um, had become extinct and it was a specific subspecies of, um, I can't remember the actual Latin name, but along with the great hawk, they're most probably the only true British birds that have become extinct in, you know, in recent centuries. And we saw them, they were just by, yeah, they were by the um, warden's hut, yeah, this sort of like a little tiny um, sort of bus shelter where he was, where they sold sort of um, various sorts of uh, memorabilia for, the, for Minsmere. And they were just nesting outside, and um, that was it. And I mean, technically, I think some of the birds are now re-nesting again in the UK. 
um, have, have sort of come in from Scandinavia, so they're not true British British um, redback shrikes. But um, yeah, that was that was my first rule of sort of introduction to sort of proper bird washing with proper birds. Yeah. We saw things like ospreys and bitterns, avocets. Um, I mean, osprey was some sort of migratory bird, but I mean. That was yeah, an amazing sighting. I think it was about another 20 years before I saw another osprey. Yeah, I remember seeing redback shrikes um, in the sort of mid 80s um, in Santon Downham in Norfolk. And I, think that was, I think that was the last one, the one in Santon Downham in that bush and everyone used to go there every springtime. She just wants to say hi to everybody. So I don't know if you can see her. This is my, 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 my um, bird watching um, companion. She's my excuse for sort of getting out every day out of lockdown to go bird watching. And we've had some great, I mean, literally we live up in the Chiltern Hills. And so for the last sort of, of course, 40 odd days like yourself, David, we've been going up there. And um, one of the great things that we've got um, is a sort of chalk escarpment. And um, I've counted, I think 10 individual ring oozles. I know that they are your favorite bird, aren't they? And um, it's amazing that um, Bedfordshire is sort of like 70, 80 miles from the sea. And it's most probably, you know, it's one of the most landlocked um, counties. It's most probably one of the worst counties, it's a small county. There's no real wetlands. Um, but the great thing, it's got a stretch of chalk escarpment on the sort of northern end of the Chiltern Hills. And um, Ringoos or they winter down in the Atlas Mountains, sort of feeding on the juniper trees there and migrating either up to Scotland, but most probably the ones that come through Bedfordshire, heading up to Scandinavia. And for sort of like three weeks every year, they just sort of like camp out. And traditionally, they've always, I think there's a place called Blows Downs in Dunstable, which I'm sure you've been up there many a time. Yeah, because I, when I used to follow football, I used to watch Manchester United, and whenever Manchester United played Luton, I would not go to the match and go to Blows Down, especially obviously in the spring looking for ring oozles, which I never actually saw. Then. No, I mean, that's it. this year I think there's been one or two there, but on, on my local patch, you stand up and you look down and um, working it out with the different gaps where there's been arrivals. A maximum on one day were four, but um, I saw the last one, I think it's something like last Thursday. And um, I mean, yeah, they're just sort of magical birds. I know that they, they are your favourite bird, aren't they? Absolutely. And I'm lucky that I saw one in Extra Majuda. This, this spring, which is a rarity. Um, I, if I hadn't seen that, I'd be crying right now. May have had to end the interview. <laughs> one of the Zoomers here to take over because it would have been a very emotional moment for me. But luckily, I, I've, uh, I've seen it. Going back to your Mincemere, first Mincemere days, that guy, Bert. Is it yeah, Bert? Bert Axel, yes. Yeah, was he the one with a very deep, the booming voice? Oh no, that, there was a guy that always used to be in the Island of Mir, and I think he was either a captain or a major. We called him That's a major. Right, yeah. Yeah. And he was standing there, and I'm going to you know, sort of embarrass myself. And he says, Marsh, hurry And he sort of shouted out, and he was louder than the bittens. Yeah. And I mean, the whole hide, so everyone sort of like swept to the other end. Because I mean, back in sort of like the early 70s and 80s, Marsh areas were you know, really rare. I think back in 1970, it was most probably sort of only one or two nesting pairs. In Britain, and again, I mean, what a great success story! I mean, going back to Bedfordshire, being a poor county, we've got a new nature reserve sort of created with lottery funding. Um, up in the, this, just where everyone knows Captain Tom, it's literally a stone's throw where Captain Tom lives, a place called Marston Mortain, and they've had uh, nesting marsh areas and bittens there over the last couple of years. Yeah, so I remember being in the hide of my good friend uh, Cornelius Ravenring the <laughs> Third. <laughs> yes, he's got a great name. Um, <laughs> and um, we were teenagers, 19 years old or whatever. He'd driven us to Mincemeat. I remember sitting in the, uh, the hide and I'd, all of a sudden, bitter! <laughs> Loud, booming voice. And it scared the, the Jesus out of us. Yeah. And it looked out and we saw this bittern flying past. It was actually a, a new bird for us. It was, uh, we were delighted with that, which is good. Um, you've written a few books. One of them is this one. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the other one is, is it the Tales of the Tabloid Twitch? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I remember reading the other one because I've got this one here, but the other one I've got in the UK. And I remember reading in the very beginning, 
uh, you talked about this really funny story when you had to give a, a talk at the British Birdwatching Fair. Oh. Can, you, can you recount that story? Because when I read it, it had been stitched. It was, I mean, I basically, like, I, I'm, I, I don't like public speaking. It's one of those things that, I mean, I've always sort of, you know, prefer writing than speaking words. And so I sort of basically got my speech ready, learnt it word perfectly, got up on stage and, and it was talking about basically about being a, a tabloid twitcher for want of a word about talking about how I managed to get a newspaper um, column and so I started off and it was going well on the slides yeah you know what getting the slides right you get the wrong slide up it, that's a problem for many speakers so the slides went perfectly and after about sort of, I think I had a sort of 40 minute sort of session and after about 20 minutes I got to the end and the guy said we need another 20 minutes and I started improvising I sort of went into my one-man act and it literally sort of fell on deaf ears so being a sort of journalist as a basically I mean you, you all know not that I'm a great drinker but I said Let, let's all sort of retire to the bar so I thought this took this crocodile of people over from the bird fair we all end up going to the bar and it sort of managed to carry carry on talking and I think yeah with a sort of a few sort of osprey owls or something like that I sort of lubricated enough to sort of like recount some of the stories that I then say actually in the sort of public auditorium you're not going to ask many of those are you <laughs> what um what's it like being a journalist uh, uh a birder and a journalist working for a publication which may not necessarily be that sympathetic towards conservation or even sympathetic towards birds and birders because you often look at the media I mean it annoys me when I look at papers or even get interviewed when you're just labeled as a twitcher and yeah. by the way there's nothing wrong with twitching at all I mean if you want to rush off and look after look for rare birds that's great but that's not what I'm about basically and I you give the interview you tell them you're a birder and then next thing it says twitcher in the headline is that were you under that kind of pressure when you were working for them I mean to start off with I mean I won't say so much journalists are cliché, and I won't even say that sort of tabloid newspapers are necessarily cliché, but everyone's got their view on them, that, um, which are invariably clichés. And so you would think that they're very unsympathetic and sort of bird watchers flock together and twitchers are basically bearded and predominantly male and predominantly loony. And I was very lucky that I actually had, um, I was working on... Um, and I, I'll sort of recount this story, and if there's, if there's anyone who's offended by it, um, it, it does have a good ending. But basically, um, back in the day, I was working on the Daily Star, and we had a new news editor, and I don't know if you remember, back in sort of like 25, 30 years ago, um, there were page three girls in the newspapers, sort of bare-breasted women. And there was a sort of, um, the, the owner of our newspaper came up with an edict that he didn't want too many bare-breasted ladies in the newspaper. Um, and because I think he'd sort of been, you know, it was sort of, you know, fortunately sort of, you know, women were getting um, upset about sort of newspapers just having sort of um, titillatory sort of pages. So um, the, the editor came in to me and sort of said, look, I'd really like a newspaper like I used to do a bird watching column. So I started it, did it, did it the first week. And I think the first week it was a story about Steve Gantlett, who's well known, I think he's now the number one British Twitcher, um, going up to see a little busted up on Shetland. And I was writing it sort of really, really sort of like, you know, getting as much sort of bird, bird facts in there as possible. And then subsequently, a sort of, he was asked by one of the in uh, newspaper industry um, magazines that why had the Daily Star of all the papers actually set up and had a bird watching column. And he turned around to say he just wanted more tits in the paper. And that was sort of, you know, we must really upset a lot of people thinking that. But given his word, he was quite interested in the, the person, the editor. And he just ran it. And I kept it going in the Daily Star for sort of 10 years. And then we were taken um, over by another newspaper group. And um, I then sort of moved over to the, to the Sunday Express. And the Sunday Express editor sort of said, no, I definitely want the bird watching column. So it celebrated its 25th anniversary last November. And I've just written this week's column uh, for, this, you know, for this week. And I don't get any interference. And I like to think, I mean, I, I write to non-bird watchers, but try and get as many messages across. But going back to being, um, I, I 
subsequently became environment editor for Sunday Express. And um, my, my counterpart on the Daily Express, um, John Ingham, who's a really keen bird watcher himself. And, you know, we've, I think we are most probably two of the sort of keenest sort of uh, journalists who are bird watchers anywhere. Um, I don't think there's um, any other sort of employed journalists who actually go out bird watching on a regular basis. So um, I think we do quite a good job between us, really. I mean, we've, we've both won the British Trust for Ornithology's um, Dillis Breeze Medal for um, conservation um, journalism, which is, which is nice. And uh, again, on sort of general conservation and animal welfare, the Express and the Sunday Express, I think, as leaders. Yeah. And you, um, as a Twitcher, I, I've always found this hard to kind of comprehend. I mean, you... Did you, I mean, you did call yourself a Twitch at one point. You were a Twitch. Oh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got, I've, I mean, my British list is a bit quirky. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm, a dyed, I'm a dyed in the wall southerner. Um, I, I get a nosebleed going up to, to Rutland Water every year. Um, I've only ever been to Scotland once in my life. And if we get time, I'll go into the reasons why for that in a minute. But um, so I twitched, but I've only ever twitched in a line south of the Severn and the Wash. So I used to go to the Isles of Scilly regularly and Norfolk and sort of Kent and those areas. So um, back in the 80s and the early 90s, it's sort of things that were happening in that area. I'd sort of you know, rush off and I live in Luton. Um, which is the home of Lee Evans, who is sort of, you know, most, probably the most best known British Twitcher of them all. And um, so, you know, that, that was fun, fun sort of twitching then. Um, but in, in the sort of latter years, really, what with, you know, well, having, a, having a sort of full time job on the newspaper, you just couldn't sort of um, down pens at any given moment and chase after a wall creeper or something like that. <laughs> But there is one bird that you, I couldn't believe it when you told me several years ago, you've never seen. And it's a bird that I thought, what? And your reason for not seeing it is that you don't want to see it. You want, you want to see it in your own way, don't you? You want to see it especially for yourself. So what is that bird and why have you, have you seen it yet? No, I've still not seen it. I mean, my, the, the bird is Atlantic Puffin. Um, and... Basically, I mean, there's, there's lots of stories about the reason why I haven't seen it. But going back to, I went up to Scotland to do my um, geography A-level uh, field, field course so that for one of the papers. And during the course of going to, going to the Isle of Egg, which um, we went there early in the season, so the puffins hadn't arrived, but managed to get arrested twice. Um, I got shot at, I got... Um, well, so got arrested twice, shot at, um, got stranded on the Isle of, Isle of Muck for three days with no food. And so I vowed ne never to go back to Scotland. And I mean, fortunately, I mean, I, I was brought up on, you know, brought up on a, um, my parents both worked for Vauxhalls, the car factory, which we, we, I mean, back in sort of the um, late 60s, early 70s, I think we were reasonably affluent. So we never went on British seaside holidays. We, we used to go on a sort of package tour to sort of Spain and sort of get interested in birds like hoopos. And s subsequent for that, I am, um, once I realised that I started sort of having a proper British list that I hadn't seen puffin, I decided that I'd avoid it at any cost. And my ambition now in retirement is to actually go around and see all the world's outsets. And I mean, I've been to California and sort of, um, I've been sort of quite a lot on the Pacific coast. So I've seen um, some really good ones, but the idea is to sort of see the whole world's, I think it's 24 now, species of outsets and then see an Atlantic puffin last of all. And the idea is for them to actually, um, to work with a charity some are ringed in their nest burrows one year. They'll go off to the Atlantic and mature over the next sort of 18 months. And when they return, I've seen all, I would have seen all the world's owlsids and come back and see my, my Atlantic puffin, so to speak. Okay, so I just to get myself organized for that. Just to translate for those who uh, do not know what owlsids are, they are orcs and orcs um, include Orcs as a family, which includes puffin and guillemots and, and stuff like that. So what Stuart's saying is he wants to sort of go around it the other way around and see all the birds, all the orc family, and then see puffin last. Is there anyone actually, any zoomers out there who have not seen a puffin? Um, 
if you um, go to your, if, you, if you're not familiar, you can actually ask questions or wave or have you by going to the participants thing and there should be some sort of uh, reactions button there so you can actually uh, react. But it'd be interesting to see because I thought that everyone on the planet or at least everyone in the UK that had any interest in birds would have seen a puffin. But in fact, I've met several people since who have never seen a puffin. And there's me. I've seen puffin not only in the classic places like Shetland and other sort of areas off the, off the coast of Britain. I've even seen puffin standing on Hammersmith Bridge watching two on the Thames one winter about 15, 16 years ago. So <laughs> it's just incredible. I don't know how you can avoid not seeing them. Well, that's, I mean, I... I literally got pictures of my friends when we've been out twitching up in Norfolk and things like that, doing a sea watch. And, um, you know, autumn especially, there's puffins go down the sort of North Sea coast. And there's me watching inland while they're all watching out to sea. But just something that's a nice bit of trivia, that puffins are technically not birds, they're fish. And, um, but basically this story d derives from back in the, um, I think it was in the sort of 17th century, that there was... Um, French clerics decided that to get round eating meat um, during Lent, um, they um, they wanted to feed on puffin flesh because um, their puffins nested on the sort of uh, the, the French coastline in those days, and um, so that they could get their special dispensation to be able to eat puffins because it was a main, major stable, um, they were given permission by the Pope. Um, to actually go ahead and eat puffins. But the way around it was he declared that they were fish. So technically, puffins are fish. It's interesting, there's a few people here. Um, Ronique, who's in the West Coast, is in Seattle actually, in, in America. She saw her first puffins in Iceland and Susan Warlow has been trying to see them for years. And Maya Brambrick, Bambrick, sorry, uh, hasn't seen one too. So maybe I'm being a bit too harsh on my... <laughs> <laughs> Why, why were you shot at um, on Muck? Well, basically, we, we were up on, um, just going up there, it was a geography field trip, and on the way up there, one of the lads was messing around, on, and it was back in the sort of 70s, and he was in one of these sort of very ornate train um, carriages, and he was messing around on the seat, and he fell over and landed on the glass window and effectively stabbed himself very badly. And so we had to pull the communication cord. And by the time we'd gone to the next station, the boy had been taken off to hospital and the local police were in court. So he was all sort of marched off and had to explain what we were happened. But while we were up on muck, and it was a, back in the um, 70s, it was effectively a fiefdom up there. And it was run by a laird. And one of his relatives was, um, let's say, a few puffins short of a flock. And uh, we were walking along the Greek uh, beach one day and it was fantastic. There was some um, great northern divers and black-throated divers out in the sea. And it was really, really sort of wonderful wilderness. And suddenly the sort of dust, uh, there was puffs of dust coming up. And the guy, this guy was sort of perched up on top of the hillside and he was just taking pot shots with us with a 2-2 rifle. And we had to crawl along the beach <laughs> to avoid him. That's funny. Yeah. Um, Talking about you got marooned on muck. Yeah. Um, you and I got marooned once. That's it. I mean, one of the, one of the sort of stories I would tell my grandchildren about when they're old enough. But basically, um, David and I, we, we decided to go to the Azores. And um, for any European bird watchers, the Azores is a gateway to American birds. It's... Um, 1500 miles out in the middle of the Atlantic, it's a um, volcanic archipelago. And David and I were on the most western of these of the islands, um, an island called um, Flores. Yeah. And um, we'd had a fantastic time with um, David. I think you found a catbird, didn't you? Which was most probably only about the fourth or fifth European catbird. And um, we had American red starts, black and white warblers, rose-breasted crossbeaks. Um, God, um, trying to think else. Upland sandpipers, hosts of um, western sandpipers. So, I mean, really, really great, great rare birds. And while we're watching this, a uh, weather forecast comes out and mentions a, a certain hurricane. Hur hurricane? I can't, I never, don't pronounce my H's very well because I'm a Londoner. But it was Hurricane Otto. 
And we watched it coming in on the Sunday afternoon. There was this sort of great sort of mountain of cloud slowly sweeping across to Flores. And it hit us with a vengeance and um, sort of like 80 mile per hour winds and um, massive amounts of rain. And so the next day we were due to fly off and we got to the airport and um, little airport and waiting for this sort of little single seater aircraft, a single engine aircraft to land and take us off. And they said, no way, the pilot won't make it. So that was the, that was the I think, the Saturday or the Sunday. Happened again on the Monday, again on the Tuesday, again on the Wednesday. And it was just like Groundhog Day. We would turn up at the airport and there was a lady on the um, ticket counter saying, not today. And so because of the EU um, flight regulations, if you can't be flown off, they have to book you into a hotel. So we were in a hotel and there was no one coming onto the island. So they allowed us to keep our um, hire car. And we just had sort of days and days of sort of bird watching, finding more and more rare birds. And I don't, I don't think I actually managed to, I'd already written them um, Birdman Abroad when we were there. So um, there's an excuse to write a whole new, whole new book out of that one. Yeah. We had a great time, didn't we? We did. But there was actually a little twist to that tale as well, because we had another guy with us, a photographer, who was with me, actually. And the problem was that his wife was about to have breast, uh, a breast operation because she had breast cancer and he wanted to be with her. And unfortunately, I think the day was like a Wednesday and every day crept closer and closer. I think we actually managed, managed to fly on a Tuesday or something, we managed to get a flight because we were really worried as he was, but he wouldn't be able to go and see his, his, his wife, which uh, would have been a terrible thing. Um, as you're here, I just want to publicly thank you actually, because in 2014, you wrote uh, quite a lot about my Vote for Britain's National Bird campaign, um, which I... <laughs> um, for those, again, who may not be uh, up on this, I had this campaign to get Britain to vote for a national bird, and um, the robin, unfortunately, fortunately, was voted as, the, uh, as a national bird. But um, Stuart actually did a lot in terms of, a lot of column inches for me in terms of promoting the whole... Um, um, you know, votes, which is great. No, I mean, that was, unfortunately, I still don't know, because we, we lobbied quite, you know, people in power, basically. I think that um, David Cameron was PM at the time, and sort of talking to people at Downing Street, and we were talking to sort of um, Buckingham Palace, and things like that, to actually say, let's adopt it. But it's still, the country still has not adopted a national bird. And I think that, um, you know, I think, especially people from overseas, um, I think that the robin is sort of so indicative of British spirit. It's all, you know, it's a small, robust, chest-pumping bird. And I was, I was watching one, of, you know, just uh, yesterday I got a camera, I can't put the picture up here, but it was one collecting um, nesting material and this nesting at the back of the garden. And, you know, everyone loves a robin. They're just sort of great, great birds. Hence my this one ear. There's this one made out of um, metal. I mean, you know, robust, yes, mm -hmm. territorial, um, uh, feisty, uh, <laughs> picks fights all the time, aggressive. It totally typifies Britain, I think. Yeah. And what's interesting is that the robin, the robin in the UK and Ireland, behaves so differently to the robin on the continent, even though it's the same species. Yeah. Totally. I mean, yeah, they're difficult birds. I mean, you know, they're, they're real forest birds in um, Central Europe. And I mean, yeah. lots of our robins in winter come from come from Europe. They sort of, you know, we've got a maritime climate here. So and people quite often sort of, you know, say, oh, I heard this bird singing. It's sort of middle of winter, say Christmas Day. And they can hear a bird singing and there's a sort of robin out on the lamppost or on a gatepost or something like that. I, yeah, I, I I know you were going to ask me what, what's my favourite bird, and I think a robin would be way up there. It's, um, yeah, I think I'd have to have a, my own national vote, but we'll come to that in a moment whenever you, whenever you want to. But the thing is with a robin, I mean, I'm getting so many people contacting me saying, what's this singing in the background? And nine and a half times out of ten, it's a robin. Yeah, and they're, they're great birds. I mean, I was out this morning and... Um, I mean, one of the sort of lockdown things I've been doing is sort of looking at the same patch every day and doing real sort of like micro birding. I mean, back in the um, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, there was a thing called the Common Bird Census, which um, allowed bird watchers. It was for the British Trust for Ornithology. And you would go out and you'd have a map 
and you'd chart all the birds that were on in the area where you were bird watching and what they were doing and you'd do like little dotted lines with from one bird flew from A to B. And I was doing something very similar today because you know, obviously you can't travel in lockdown. And so um, I've got a very small marsh, um, which is most probably only it's the source of the River Lee, which runs into the Thames. So people most probably might know the River Lee. And that's actually that's where Luton gets its name from, from the source of the Lee. And it was just great looking at sort of birds of things like reed buntings, but the number of robins that were in that sort of um, maybe half a dozen sort of football pitch area, um, sort of five, possibly six pairs. Amazing. Um, Ron Ronique has said that she loves her American robins. Um, but I have an issue with this because, again, it goes back to the names that um, our American friends call their birds because the, the American robin really should be the red-breasted thrush. Um, because recently, um, I'm sure you know Stuart, but recently the robin itself, which was always seen, seen to be a member of the thrush family, is now being placed with flycatchers, old yeah. world flycatchers. So it's not even related to thrush, thrushes that closely. And it's really interesting that there's so many birds around the world that have the name robin, even though there's only, in reality, I think, um, it's Eurificus, Eurificus, that's the um, Latin name for Robin, isn't it? I think yeah, it, it comes from the letter, the word for red, Erythica is, yeah. Okay, well, I think there's only, well, there used to be only two other different species of Robin, Eurificus, but I think there's, that's one of them has been downgraded, so maybe there's only one other species in the world, and I think that's found on a tiny island in Japan. Oh, right. I wasn't aware of that. I mean, there's a, I know there's the red-tailed Robin, which, um, I've got the Book of Thrushes there behind me, which is, turned up in the UK but just as I mean uh, going back to the American Robin just in case anyone hasn't seen it the original Mary Poppins su supposedly set in um, sort of merry old England with Dick Van Dyke and just as Dick Van Dyke isn't they um, wasn't much of an authentic cockney um, when she's singing spoonful of sugar what bird should come down on her finger when she's singing it but an American Robin <laughs> I don't know if you remember if anyone's seen that but yeah. it's, um, and, and, it, and you know, you'd have thought they'd perhaps get a proper British Robin or European Robin. They, the they all, in films, they always get it wrong. I get so annoyed. You know, I was watching, I mean, when Breakback, Breakback Mountain came out, it's supposed to be in Canada, yet there's hooded crows all over the place. And I remember watching I Am Legend with Will Smith, and he's walking through the, the deserted streets of New York that have been taken over by nature, and there's a European nightjar. <laughs> Well, a calling. I mean, sound soundtracks. They um, that's another thing. Like like um, tawny owls, and you know, you've got sort of like stories about Ireland and sort of like you know during the troubles and the IRA and things like that. And they have tawny owls hooting. So yeah, it's um, one one really good bird. By the way, just just to interrupt um, for those who don't know, tawny owls are not found in Ireland. That's why. They're so yeah. Uh, one bird that really confused me, um, looking at American TV programs, um, was hearing Willow Warbler. And then yeah. going to America for the first time, um, is it Rock Wren or Canyon Wren? Um, I think it's Rock Wren has got a song identical to a Willow Warbler. That was House Finch. Renique, Renique, I, Renique, I think we may need you in there to, to, to actually confirm this, but... The house finch in America also has a very similar yeah. as well. Yeah, so so they met they you know, Hollywood's not all to blame. <laughs> and also one more thing on the film front, Charlie's Angels. There's a scene when I can't remember what I think it was um, I can't remember who it was, what character it was, but she was um, Bos Boswell was in in prison, and he's talking. And then there's a bird singing in the background, and she says, "Ah, what's that?" I can hear something. She said, it's a pygmy nuthatch. I know exactly where you are. <laughs> I was thinking, that's not a pygmy nuthatch. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so anyway, the reason why you're here today um, is to talk about micro-birding, um, yeah. which is basically, as you term it, um, you know, intensely watching a local patch under lockdown. So what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, as I say, going back to, I, I 
used to carry out a um, common bird census back in the sort of 90s for the BTO, British Trust for Ornithology. And that was a way of actually getting really intensive um, idea of what's what's going on in a in specific area. So it was just one farm. And I, I basically got to know, I think, every bird that was nesting on that farm. Um, it was an area of most probably about sort of 20, 30 football pitches. Um, and so I decided to try it again, obviously not being able to go into a car, um, not being able to sort of extend bird watching for more than what well, in the UK. I mean, the general rule is that you're only allowed to exercise for an hour a day. Um, I'm lucky that I, I may have introduced my little spaniel earlier. So it's, it's a slightly greater excuse to go out for a bit longer because I think the general agreement is that you can take a dog out for for two exercise walks as well. So I've been looking at the same patch every day and the idea is just to walk around very slowly. Um, remembering something I learned from you, David, is to make sure that you look up as well as look down. And you go around, you have your notebook and you literally sort of, once you've got a bird where you're singing, you put an initial for the bird, put a little ring around it, and you can put different sim symbols. And if you see a bird, say, carrying nesting material, um, you've got a good idea that it's going to be nesting in that area. If you see it with food in its beak, then it's a very good suggestion that it's actually feeding, feeding young. And, and if you see one bird fly from an, one area to another area, you can sort of chart that flight path and you can start to get to get um, an idea of um, territories. I mean, one of the things that I witnessed from, you know, first time I've actually seen it last week, there were two song thrushes, and song thrushes have taken a bit of a hiding in the UK over the last sort of couple of decades. And there were, I heard this noise, and it sounded like this. And I, you know, it sounded like a mannequin from Central America. And I sort of went around a, um, an area of bramble and there were these two song thrushes standing face to face and they were jumping up and punching each other with their wings and the, it was the sound of wing beats and I've never seen that before and I don't think I would ever have actually seen it, ever have seen it if it weren't for the fact of me walking around sort of an area of bramble and scrub you know maybe sort of like 30 times in a period of an hour and yeah, you know, I came away and sort of thought, God, I've actually sort of, you know, you're always learning something with birding, but learning something literally is sort of like a couple of hundred yards from where I live. And it's been, you know, the, the same this morning, there was a couple of reed buntings, and I was just one male reed bunting, and I'm sure he's got two females on the go, a bit like a dunnock. And, he, and he's basically um, helping to sort of two females run two nests. And he's, he's you know, basically, you know, being polygamous, for want of a better word. They have such an interesting um, sex life, the Dunnock. Oh, a yeah. dull looking bird, brown, grey and black, you know, very, very indiscreet. Or should I say very discreet? But very <laughs> indiscreet in terms of its, its uh, sexual life, because obviously the males have many females and the females have many males. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, you know, to act, I haven't seen it during this sort of lockdown, but I've seen it actually in the garden where the, a male will sort of, um, before he copulates with a female, he'll go up and he'll sort of peck her cloaca and um, get her to eject sperm from the previous... Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to think yeah, mating. So that he's ensuring that he's, he's sort of passing on his own genetic material. It's just, it's just amazing. I mean, if, you know, if, they, if they were humans, they'd be sort of, you know, going back to tabloid newspapers, they'd be all over the pages. Because I, um, actually talking about humans, I read that if um, a Dunnock was a human, then during the height of his sort of breeding season, his testes would be the size of rugby balls. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I, th I, th the, the, I think the one bird that might be big there is an aquatic warbler. And literally, um, They've sort of taken, sort of um, taken them, um, you know, obviously for um, experimentation, for want of a better, for dissection. And if it's pro rata, as that actually an aquatic warbler would need a wheelbarrow <laughs> to walk around because they're so huge, and they're just literally they're the size of a full stop, uh, you know, sort of printed newspaper full stop in um, in winter. And they come onto their nesting grounds and they just swell and swell and swell. 
and it's sort of full of testosterone and it allows them to sing continuously all through the day and obviously provides lots of energy for um, basically getting food for young and things like that and um, yeah I wouldn't fancy that though. <laughs> At this point, I just wondered if anyone, any, any of our Zoomers here have had any experience on their local patches um, in terms of, you know, on lockdown, have you seen anything interesting, any interesting bits of behaviour? Or even, actually, would you be interested in asking Stuart a question? And all you have to do is put your hand up. Okay. <laughs> Ronique. Hi. Hi, Stuart. Hi. How, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Good, thank you. Um, I was wondering, were you um, doing a lot of patch birding before lockdown, or is this kind of a new thing for you? I must admit that I should do lots more patch birding, but it has been very much symptomatic of, of lockdown. I'm very lucky. I, I, I look out um, from my bedroom window and we have this, um, the chalk hills, basically they, they were um, grazed by sheep and livestock over the centuries. And so they're, they're bare chalk um, with, with grassland on it, which has got its own sort of um, biology. But although it's very close to me, I tend not to go there. I, I mean, if there's wetlands about, um, you can get more bangs for your bucks if you've got a few hours bird watching going up to say, uh, we've got some lots of gravel pits in Bedfordshire where they used to um, basically excavate clay for making bricks. So all the bricks in London were made of, you know, come from clay in Bedfordshire, um, these giant holes. And lots of them are filled with water now. So that tends to be my local bird watching area. But um, having to walk from A to B, I just decided that, yeah, um, to go there. Luckily, it's been through spring. And again, going back to the, the, sort of the birds that I've seen there, it sort of reshaped local bird watching to a certain degree. Because most people, we mentioned an area called Blowsdowns, which is, say, five, six miles to the west of us. And that's where ringers was were traditionally seen, and along with things like wind chats, red starts. Um, lots of warblers but just watching my local patch now I've sort of seen them in equal numbers so it's certainly um, it's in the diary for next year and I think it, it will remain very good up there for the next say two or three weeks and then the um, it then becomes very good for butterflies and for, for orchids and things like that and that's traditionally been the time when I've been going up there. Well, I know for me, I just found a couple of patches. One's about 20 blocks, so I just ride my bike there. And the other one is about a 10 minute walk. And I've lived in the same neighborhood for 20 years and never birded these two spots. And I've just found them. And the one that I ride my bike to, uh, the other day I was there and I counted 14 Western tanagers that just arrived, you know, during spring migration. They were all in the tops of the big leaf maples. And so I feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just discovered these places. So it's really exciting. Yeah, what, what where else do, do you live? I live in Seattle, Washington in the oh, US, fantastic. on the West Coast. Yes, yeah, always raining. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> you just no. tell people that so they don't move here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the thing is, I mean, you know, I mean, David is the urban birder. And um, I'm, I'm like David, I mean, I, I'm a, you know, a town kid and um, moved up to, to the countryside, but it's still very urban. I mean, the town where I live, it, it was the, the UK home for um, General Motors. So it was a bit, you know, it's a bit like Detroit. And um, when you get these little green areas, um, watching them, that's, that's where you find things. I mean, you know, those sort of migratory um, Western tanagers going through it. You know, you, you'll be surprised. They most probably have um, other species than where they've sort of wintered with and sort of carry on carrier species as well. So you can find all sorts of things. I mean, I've been lucky to have bird watching, say, Central Park in New York. And it's just amazing. Oh, yeah. You've got this sort of green oasis in a sort of concrete sort of slab. And they're just yeah. fantastic birds. Yeah. Yeah, I was in uh, Central Park for spring migration like uh, three or four years ago, and it was ridiculous it was so amazing and I, I had no idea it was really a lovely experience to see all those species coming through and yeah, yeah. I had a ton of life birds in just four hours <laughs> oh, it's amazing I mean very very funny story about the first time I ever went to Central Park I um 
I, I'm going there and um, going to the Ramble and there's all the you know, complete um, kaleidoscope of um, warblers, spectrum of warblers. You can get every colour of the rainbow there. And so I'm sort of walking around. But before I'd gone there, um, a guy had given me some advice. And this was back in the days before the um, zero tolerance and when Central Park was still sort of renowned for its crime. And he said, you know, being a limey, whatever you do, if you, if you find a body there, don't say anything, just sort of skulk away, just let things be, because if you report it, you'll be, you know, the, the, the NYPD will want to question you and you most probably won't get your flight back and things like that. So I'm skulking around in, um, in the undergrowth and sort of looking at things like sort of chestnut-sided warbler and Blackburnian warbler, <laughs> just for those who are not Brits. I mean, that's my... That's a black burning warbler. That's one of my favourite birds. Yeah. So I'm um, seeing all these warblers and literally come around the corner and what should be lying against the tree is a guy pressed against the tree, white tuxedo, two big crimson marks on his chest. I thought, oh, God, <laughs> looks like a you know, sort of mafia hit. So I sort of skulking away and suddenly it gets up and moves. And it turns out that he was an extra for a film they were filming in um, Central Park. And he was playing, the, playing a dead man for the film. But he was interested in birds and he was watching the, um, the red-tailed hawks there. And he just had time to go off set <laughs> to go bird watching. <laughs> So, yeah, but I mean, Central Park, I, mean, you know, I think, again, if, if there was anywhere in the world that I'd like to be at the moment, that would be one of those places. OK, um, thanks, Monique. I'm, a, as you know, a massive advocate for um, patch watching in urban areas, and I think I've done it all my life. I mean, my first patch was my back garden in Wembley, and then I moved on to a local park, and from there, a local reservoir and even to this day when I'm in England my local patch is in West London and the West London patch worm and scrubs is particularly interesting because when I first started going there I mean it was it's basically a whole lot of football and rugby pitches um, and a tiny bit of grassland and all of it's encircled by a very thin wedge of woodland which you can walk through in about four seconds literally uh, and then surrounding that it's, in, it's encased in industry, housing, and there's also a prison as well. So it's completely encircled. And I remember when I first started going there um, on a regular basis, and I was actually ridiculed by my birding mates, saying, what are, you, what are you doing going there? You should be going to a proper place to go birding. Particularly during migration time, I wasn't interested you know, in going to the coast to watch all these falls of migrants, because I thought to myself, the migrants don't just occur at the famous headlands and famous nature reserves. It occurs, or they occur, across a broad spectrum. So when I hear of a, a fall of migrants somewhere on the coast, I'll wait a day or two, I go to my local patch, and I see a microcosm of it, you know? And it's interesting because over time, when you go to a local patch on a regular basis, you begin, to, especially if you keep notes, you begin to see how things work. You begin to see or notice when birds turn up on migration, when birds start breeding, when birds come through for, for the winter. And at the worm and scrubs, there are certain species like the wheat ear, which and red starts, which turned up every year. And when I used to report it to the London uh, bird uh, report people, at first they ridiculed it, saying, oh, it's just an accident, what have you. And I said, no, these birds actually turn up the whole time. It's just that there's no one here ever to see them. And I think, the most poignant of those birds is my favourite bird, the ring ouzel, which came to see me and has done for the last 15 years. Every year, you know, usually during April, I see at least one or two ring ouzels on migration or my patch in, in West London, in the middle of concrete London. So it shows that you should never shut your eyes and your mind to the idea that birds are, are you know, not here. Because people often think, oh, I'm in London or I'm in this city, I'm in a city, there's only going to be pigeons and sparrows. If you don't open your mind to it, you don't see them. You don't exactly. see them. One of the things today, I, I was out and I never saw a chaffinch. And there is a real serious concern in the UK that we're having a massive crash with the chaffinch population. Uh, British Trust for Ornithology is just going to start a um, big investigation into it. But I must have heard, say, 20 odd greenfinches in chaffinch habitat 
sort of doing the same things, just singing from trees. And this has happened in the space of, say, like two years. Chaffinch numbers in my local area have gone down and greenfinches have gone back. And it may well be linked to the same thing that uh, there's a disease, which I won't try and pronounce. It's known as trick. Yeah, it's just that. Yeah. I think it's something like that. Um, and it seemed like it's passed from greenfinches onto the chaffinch population. And perhaps, you know, talking in the time of COVID, um, it may well be the greenfinches have finally got an immunity to it. And so they're having a bounce back and chaffinches are suddenly just taking it on them. I mean, it's one of those diseases that's thought to be picked up from people feeding birds, um, from bird tables and not perhaps, um, and that's where you know, we might actually be witnessing something of a serious note because, you know, chaffinches were once one, I think after um, blackbirds and wrens, that's sort of most probably our commonest bird. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maya's got a question for you. But I pressed the wrong button. I think she was asking, have you always wanted to be, um, in, have you, hang on, let me just uh, press the wrong button there. I've pressed shared screen instead of the <laughs> chat. What did you want to be when you were younger? Was it bird related? I, obviously like anyone, I wanted to be a footballer. And um, when that weren't to be, I wanted to be a policeman. And then I got turned down from the police, but I think my, I was quite left wing in my youth. I had sort of long hair and a bit of a hippie. And I wrote a letter to the local newspaper, and didn't bother posting it, and left it on the side in the sixth form um, table. And someone posted it for me, and I ended up getting an um, invite for an interview at the Luton News. And um, sort of quite liked the idea of being a reporter. And yeah, I mean, that was in sort of 1974, so they sponsored me through college. Um, which was really, you know, really, really useful. And then sort of, I, um, 77, I started sort of working as a proper, you know, proper reporter. And the, I mean, it's moved so quickly. I mean, I'm very lucky. I worked on sort of like lots of sort of major stories, you know, 9-11, Princess Diana being killed, um, two Gulf Wars. And so I, I think journalism found me. I mean, I've always been the chatterbox. And I think that's quite quite a useful thing I mean but one thing I've learned I mean you know, I'm sort of in my 60s now and I finally discovered um I've been reading a biography of a, a policeman who was a police negotiator and he said the most important thing he learned being a um, policeman especially being a police negotiator is to listen and I just realized that I, I think I haven't listened as much as I should have done over the years and I think that's the key thing that you know perhaps um I wish I, if I turned the clock back for 40, you know, sort of 40 odd years of journalism. I mean, obviously you listen and you write it down, but you never perhaps quite really, really listen to what people are saying. So that's my sort of, um, my retirement resolution to make sure I listen. I know I'm doing a lot of talking now, but um, <laughs> listening is really, really important. And talking about football, um, you were telling me that, about projects you're involved with, um, with football clubs up and down the country. Yeah, I mean, I am... Um, Basically, I played football sort of in my in my youth, and um, I got a back injury in sort of twenties, and so get, gave it up. And um, I'll go back to sort of my football career because that's helped. So basically, I, I took it up again when I was sort of just coming up to sixty, and um, I absolutely love it. And um, I played for Luton Town over the sixties, um, so as a veterans team. And I mean, the Luton Town are a sort of they're a second tier and professional team i'm not a professional footballer i don't get paid for it i actually pay to play but um on the basis of this you play you see that football clubs have estates going back to um sort of world with scrubs where there's sort of training um, football grounds there for amateur football all the clubs have um, estates all very private all very sort of secretive they don't want other teams spying on them and i just want my the club that i actually support at Tottenham Hotspur and they just built a new stadium but they were building a new training complex as well and um, I got an invite to go down to see the work they were doing and they had this area of land and they're looking at turning it into a nature reserve so I got chatting to them and I wrote a piece about it and then lo and behold the Football Association which run the England team got in touch with me and said would I like to go up and see what they're doing and they got 300 acres of sort of um, 
parkland in the middle of England and they're going to create a nature reserve there. So on, this, on the basis of that, we've produced a thing called Team England, uh, sorry, Team Nature, um, which is sort of wildlife organisation. So you mentioned the British Trust for Ornithology already, but it's the Mammal Society, Bug Life, Plant Life, Frog Life, um, Brian May's Charity, which is a hedgehog and badger and wildlife um, saving organisation. Um, and we've come together and what we're doing is going to produce uh, provide expertise for football clubs and it was going great we'd actually got a, um, a mission statement and we've come together um, sadly because of um, COVID uh, COVID that's a Freudian slip there uh, because of COVID um, things are in abeyance at the moment um, so football is in a real state of sort of apoplexy in the UK and no one knows when it's you know, the professional game is going to restart I mean all amateur football is cancelled as well um, clubs are losing millions of pounds so hopefully when you know when the disease has passed and um, we get back into things we can go back and reach to clubs um, we've been talking to Manchester United, Manchester City um, I think lots of clubs have actually taken birds in particular, but wildlife as um, symbols. I mean, so lots of football clubs in the UK, I mean, Newcastle United are known as the Magpies, um, Warsaw are the Swifts, West Bromwich Albion are the Throstles, named after thrushes. Um, so they've got lots of birds in their history, and I think that they'll realise that they can, um, you know, they should perhaps pay something back to nature. It doesn't cost them much. They've got, they've got land and going back to the whole sort of concept of sort of micro birding. I mean, Tottenham have got 75 acres. Um, you know, on the, I, the day that I was walking around there, we had hobby flyover, sparrow hawk. Um, they've got great crested newts in there um, in some of the sort of uh, water areas that they've, they've got to, to um, water the pitches and things like that. So, you know, yeah. As they're all suburban areas, they've most probably all got great, um, great opportunities to create, you know, really good wildlife um, sanctuaries. And what's more, they can then have that as an outreach uh, to their fans to get them involved in nature as well. So that's that. that's the principle. I mean, to make nature sexy. I mean, to make it like football um, as, as popular is sort of that's the, the real thrust. Because I mean, you know. I would think that everyone in the UK, you only have to bump into someone. Very few people have not got a football team that they support. And if they sort of see their club doing something, they might just realise that nature is, is important. Good. Um, Zoomers, any questions at all? OK, well, I think that leads me to ask you uh, the kind of final questions. You've already answered what your favourite bird is. Has it changed since you, since you mentioned it earlier? Oh, I, I love robins. I, um, I love the hobby because that's, uh, that's the symbol of our local um, bird club. And I mean, for those non-UK um, listeners, that's a, a, a falcon, um, which actually shares its name with a football game, Subutio, um, which basically means small buzzard. And... Um, and the other bird that I really love as well is a yellow wagtails. I think that they come in you know, a bit like um, Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. They, they literally come in so many varieties. And I mean, they're a bird that's sort of in a state of evolutionary flux. You actually see them, they're evolving as we, as we speak, basically. I mean, the British one's got a yellow head. You immediately go across the channel to France, it's got a blue head and you go to, Eastern Europe and they've got blackheads and all different colours in between. So they're, they're my three favourite birds. And of course in North America, black burning water. Uh, mammal? Um, I think it's got to be the hedgehog. Um, my, every night without fail my wife goes out, we've got hedgehogs that come to, come to the garden and it costs a fortune. We put out um, special hedgehog food, and they, you know, we, we've had up to six hedgehogs feeding in the garden, and now they're, they're hungry little things. <laughs> what about invertebrate? Um, I would think. I mean, there's lots of lots of butterflies that I really really like. Um, we get the dark green fritillary up on up on the hills here, which is a, a rare butterfly. Um, but I do like blue, blue butterflies, a common blue butterfly, I think, it was, 
you know, whenever you see it, it's a drop of sky and it's fallen down to earth. So I'd say common blue butterfly. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the current circumstances right this minute, where would you be? Um, I mean, looking at the dates, I, I, I was due to be in Hungary at the, as we speak, but that's been cancelled. I think it most probably would be Cape May in um, New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah. New Jersey. Yeah, I, sh I should be at this moment in time in Australia, uh, Colombia, and Morocco right now. <laughs> All in one go. <laughs> um, just to let you know, um, guys, um, that um, the In Conservation Move series continues uh, tomorrow. We've got Kate Bad Bradbury, sorry. She's Bad, Bad Bradbury. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Kate Bradbury. And basically, she is a wildlife gardener. So she'll be talking and giving hints on wildlife gardening. On Thursday, we got this guy, and I, to be, to be honest, I cannot, I cannot pronounce his surname or even his first name. He's, hung, he's Hungarian. Um, his short name, his pet name is Sabi. Um, his name looks like Shabogs. Shabogs. He's an artist. He's a brilliant artist, and he's going to be painting. Um, he's got a commission to paint uh, a bird called an autolan bunting, which is a very beautiful, you know, lots of beautiful colours in that bird. And he'll be painting it live and talking us through how to, to paint using watercolours. On Friday, we've got a young 14-year-old. Uh, his name is Kabir Kaul. He's uh, originally from, oh, his parents are anyway, from, from um, Dubai. But he's a massive Londoner who's trying to get people in London engaged with wildlife. And he's, he's already won awards. And I, I can see a ma massive uh, future for this guy. On Saturday, um, just confirmed yesterday, we've got a guy, called, a guy called Tony Jupiter, CBE, no less. And Tony Jupiter is the chief of English Nature. And English Nature are an organisation, government-run organisation, conservation organisation, but it's been, the history of the organisation, I'm sure Stuart can say, has been very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very kind of, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the recent decision they made, for example, was to allow some, some peregrine falcon chicks to be taken from the wild to be used in falconry. So we'll be talking about that. And I think that would be a very interesting conversation on Saturday. And on Sunday, We've got one of my heroes, his name is Lars Johnson. He is like, if you don't know, um, if you're not into, into the bird sort of world, he is one of the gods when it comes to art. And Stuart's gonna illustrate now. But basically, he, his paintings are legendary. He's an amazing man. Um, he's about 15 foot tall. He's Swedish. <laughs> and he's gonna be painting and telling, talk, talking to us about his, his work and his art. So that would be an amazing one to tune into. And all those details, all those people, you can book on my website. If you go there, you can actually check it out. So that's coming up this coming week. And also, in an, I think not necessarily next week, but maybe the week after, I'm going to do a travel week. Um, and one day we're going to have, um, it's going to be kicked off by a travel expert um, who's going to come and sort of try and predict what's going to be happening post coronavirus in terms of travel around the world so that should be an interesting one to tune into and then I'll be getting on on the next few days people from different countries to talk about the wildlife and birds in their country just to give you a little flavor of what could what could happen once uh, you get traveling again so that's what's happening over the next couple of weeks um Stuart listen thank you so much for for coming today and chatting to us it's been really great fun and I'm, I'm hoping that all uh, the people here have enjoyed it too um, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you, David. Everyone stay safe. I mean, we're living in troubled times, but um, we'll get there. It's the great thing, the power of birds and the power of nature. I mean, in fact, nature will give us the cure some, one way or the other. And hopefully this time next year, we're all in our most favourite places. Good. So keep looking up. That's all we need to do. Keep yeah. looking up. And I hope to see you guys another time. Take it easy. See you all. Bye. Bye.